Frank Vetrano, what's it like being the best player in the NHL? <laughs> we go that far. But uh, no, this year's been fun. Uh, you know, living in California, play for the Ducks. Obviously, last year was was pretty tough, and a uh, new coach and, and all that stuff this year. And it's been a good change. And, you know, we got a great bunch of guys. When you're in your upper 20s, established 20 goal guy, like, do you still think that you have it in you and that like you will be the leading goal scorer type? No, I, I like to always take it, you know, one game at a time and all that stuff. But for me, I always, you know, I want to score 20 goals every year. And, you know, once you hit 20, everything after that, it's great. You know, obviously you want to score as many goals as possible and, and help your team win. And, uh, you know, for me, um, like you said, late 20s, almost 30 here. So, you know, I want to play this game as long as I can. And as long as my body's up to it and, you know, and, and I feel good on the ice, I'll, I'll try to play this game as long as I can. Uh, you guys obviously had a tough year last year, but have been fun as hell to start this year. Uh, when you signed with the Ducks, what did you envision the timeline being like? Um, because, you know, obviously you signed f- from a contender with the Rangers and uh, Ducks were a younger team. What were, you, what were you envisioning when you signed in Anaheim? No, I was actually with the situation that was going on in Anaheim. It kind of really reminded me of when I first got to Florida. Um you know, we had a lot of guys that were kind of entering, you know, they're, I wouldn't say mid twenties, but around 24, 25. And, um, and I saw that here, we were obviously a little bit younger, but I saw the pieces that we had coming in. We obviously we signed Stromer that summer and you know, we had Zegers, Mac T and Cam Fowler has been here a long time. Troy Terry, um, you know, I can go on and on with, you know, the younger guys that we have here and, and Pat, the GM has done a great job of drafting younger players. So, you know, you can see it this year with the younger guys who've added to our lineup has been have been huge for us. And, you know, with the younger team, obviously, it takes a little bit of time to be a playoff contender. But, you know, the way we've been playing this year, you know, looks like we're in the hunt and we want to keep going. But, like I said, I, the situation coming here, it reminded me of Florida, and I was excited to be a part of it. The, uh, you mentioned Mac T. The, uh, the Mac T hype train has been in full, uh, full steam ahead this season. Say something bad about him so that we can get more attention on you and, and how well you're playing. Oh man, <laughs> I don't know if I could say anything bad about the guy. I even though I want to really bad. I mean, I would, the only thing I could really say bad about him is he's what is he twenty years old? He looks like he's forty five. But <laughs> no, that's, really, that's really the only bad thing I can say about the kid. He's a great kid. You know, he's a future leader of this team. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to play on his line. Have a really good relationship with him. He's got a great sense of humor and um, you know get along well. What's different this year under Greg Cronin? Because obviously, uh, you know, the change has been, you know, fruitful so far early in the season. Uh, what's it like been playing for him? I think accountability is basically the one thing that sticks out to me the most. And I think that's something that, you know, kind of lacked last year was accountability and playing the right way and being a good, prof- good professional every single day, not just in games, but in practices, what you do in the weight room, what you do off the ice, what you do when you go home. And, um, you know, just all the older guys talking last year and how it was like when we were younger. And for me, you know, when I signed in Boston, like I signed with a team that had a great culture and, you know, they taught me how to play in the NHL, what it takes to play in the NHL every single day. And I think that's what Crow kind of brings to the table is he preaches not just on the ice stuff, but off the ice habits and what he expects from us every single day. And some days is hard. Some days he's, I mean, every day he's completely honest with you. So you know where exactly where you stand and, I remember me as a younger player, I wanted honesty. And sometimes you don't get that at a younger age with the relationships that you have. But I think even at a young age, when you have the honesty from the coach, you know, you can become the player that you want to be and strive to be when you have the honesty and knowing what you're doing to and what you need to do to be successful. Rebuilds aren't always incremental. I, like, it's not like every year you add another young player, you gain five points in the stands. Like, it seems like the team just kind of goes from in a rebuild to like, oh shit, they've arrived. Do you think that this group can be there? Absolutely. I think the I think we've surprised a lot of teams. We're hard to play against. And obviously I think we're seven and five now. And, you know, we still got a long, long road ahead of us. We, it's an 82 game season. So anything can happen. You know, you get hot at the right time, you get cold. It's for us just to be consistent night in, night out, uh, being hard to play against. And, um, you know, like you said, I think I'm, I talked to Stromer about this when I got to New York. It's like they were in that rebuild for however long it was. It was like a smaller rebuild. And all of a sudden, they're playing in the conference final a year later. It's like 
it kind of just comes upon you that your team's ready to play for a Stanley Cup. And um, obviously it takes time, but like you said, the rebuilds kind of just, they rebuild and all of a sudden it comes to the time where your team's ready to win. I've always wanted to ask this question of a goal scorer. You have two hat tricks this season, no games with just two goals. How does your game change and how does your mindset change once you've scored two goals in a game and there's more than like five minutes left? Are you like, I got to fucking score this third one. I'm not passing the puck the rest of the game. What's it like when clearly you're playing well and also like you fucking want a hat trick? I think it obviously it comes from your line mates. Like, hey, like you're going to get that next one. And as a, as a goal scorer, if you already have two, you know that if you get a scoring chance, you know, it's just, it's going to go in. It's just how it's going that night. The puck's falling you. You're getting all the good bounces. But, uh, yeah, like goal scoring is a funny thing. Like you, you can feel horrible going into the game and you can get a goal at your first shift of the game. And it's like you have this adrenaline rush that goes to your body and it's like, why can't I have this every single game? And I think that's been a, a, a recipe that players have been looking for their entire career. Why can't I feel like this every game after you score a goal? But no, I mean, I think goal scoring is a weird thing. It comes in bunches. So when, when you're feeling good and you get one early, it's just kind of like you can't be stopped. When did your shot get awesome because i remember even when you came to the nhl you were a very good college player i don't get how and i'm not just blowing smoke like i don't get how a player with a skill as good as your shot goes undrafted so was it like a later in life thing or when did that happen believe it or not like people always ask me like young kids or even parents and you know sometimes even guys who play is like how to like like what did you do like working on your shot as a kid i was like to be honest with you like I didn't really shoot pucks as a kid growing up. I was always in the driveway with my brother and we, those street hockey balls you buy at the pro shop, like those little hard orange ones, like that's what I use in the driveway. And I think that's what got my shot to where it is because when you have to shoot some of those balls, actually in New England, when it's hot in the summer, the balls are melting. And then when it's the winter, the balls are super hard. So like you had to change the way you shot the ball. Like for me, I shoot off my toe. And, you know, and I snap it. So that's why my wrist is not like like Matthews who pulls and drags and Bedard who pulls and drags. For me, it's I just snap it. So I think, you know, shooting street hockey balls is what actually made me get the shot I have now. Fucking America runs on Duncan, man. It's always <laughs> New England. I got to yeah. ask you this question. Um, you've worn a lot of jerseys in your life, uh, in your career. What is your favorite jersey that you've worn uh, so far uh, to this point in your career? Definitely the blue shirt for the New York Rangers. Yeah. I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it gets any better than that. Playing at MSG and playing at the most famous arena in the world, like that's playing in the NHL. That's what pro professional sports is all about. Have you guys ever considered having a players only meeting in Anaheim and being like, "We are only wearing the Mighty Duck from this point forward"? Because like I, I, you might not say it, but I'll say it. Your regular jerseys suck out there. They shouldn't be sand. <laughs> who who wanted sand? I love the ducks, but it's, sand shouldn't be in the mix. Yeah, we 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 love the old school logo. I think what they did with the new jerseys this year, bringing back the retro colors and kind of putting a twist on the the Anna, the mighty duck head was really cool. And the guys love wearing the purple. I think we're actually undefeated in the purple, but I'm going to knock on wood. I'm not sure about that. Um, that's and what I'm we saying, are, though. Like, have a, have a players-only meeting and be like, listen, the results are here. People love these jerseys. We're we're establishing this as a club. We're only wearing these moving forward. No, they look unbelievable. Even, like, all the fans and everyone's family, like, those jerseys are unbelievable. And I think they're, they're, they're iconic jerseys. They're, it brings me back to my childhood watching you know, the Mighty Ducks movies. So it's, it's, uh, it's really cool to wear them. I was going to ask, did you have one as a kid? Because I'm a little older than you, but... Everyone my age and everyone around my age either had a Ducks jersey or a Ducks starter jacket. That was like the hot oh, shit. Oh, yeah. That's the 90s for you. That's 90s <laughs> colors, too. The old Ducks colors are like the 90s colors. So my brother used to have uh, – my oldest brother used to have jerseys that used to hang on the ceiling. And he had a Mighty Ducks one in there. And actually, my dad – my parents sold their house uh, last year, and he was going through all the old stuff. And he's like, I found an old Anaheim Ducks jersey. So, yeah, we had one for sure. 
So you're saying that our set is like a, a, a child's uh, bedroom decorated, <laughs> yes. essentially, is what we've done. I don't see a mighty, I don't see a mighty duck shows in the back. Uh, we, 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 we have just five, five ducks one. over in the corner. So. I was gonna. I have like a Team Mussolini bootleg. I was gonna wear. Uh, on the subject of uniforms, another thing I've always wanted to ask a player: What is it like selling your number to a player? Because you sold or traded seventy-two to Sergei Bobrovsky when. He joined Florida, and I have a lot of questions off this, but just tell me what that process was like. Yeah, I remember when uh, I knew we were going to sign him. Not knew we were going to sign him, but I knew we had a chance to sign him. I got a call. This is when Chris Pronger was working for the uh, Panthers at the time, and he called me. I was on the golf course, and he's like, hey, like we just signed uh, Bob. I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's great news. He's like, hey, like, uh, do you mind giving up 72? I was like, well, yeah, obviously you can have it. Like. <laughs> I, I have no affection to the number at all. It's the number I came with. Obviously, I like it, but definitely, uh, I'll definitely switch. And uh, I kind of put out a tweet and joking around, like, 72 is all yours. A roll actually would be nice. And then fast forward to October. Um, I think I said something about McDonald's in there, too. I, I go one of my stall after practice, and there's a Rolex bag, and then a uh, Rolex box, and there's a McDonald's bag with two double quarter pounders and two large fries and there's so much grease at the bottom of the bag that when I pulled it on my stall, like the burger and everything just fell right out. But, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a good gift. He's a great guy. He didn't have to do that at all, but, um, you know, I was happy to give it up. It, it must suck though. Cause like, say you did care about 72 and I figured that maybe you didn't have too close of a tie to 72. You wore it when you came to the NHL, but you were playing for a team that had 77, which you've worn in places since retired. So like 72, not to say that it's a throwaway number. It looked like maybe a number that you just had and maybe didn't care a ton about, but let's say you did care about it. You're in such a tough spot as the new teammate of a guy to like hold it over and drive a hard bargain because then you're being a shit teammate. But on the other hand, the guy that you're given the number to just signed for $10 million a year, even if you wanted you couldn't have like really driven a hard bargain, right? I wasn't gonna bargain regardless. He has way more games, way more games played than me, and he's making a lot more money than me. So, hey, the numbers all yours. Was there a guy early in your career when you were playing, like whether it's development program, young, uh, like junior Bruins, whatever, and it could be a future NHL or it could be somebody who didn't make it. Like, was there somebody in that group that you were like, "Fuck, we're all gonna be really good," but this whether it's Seth Jones, whomever, like, is a fucking beast? That's such a tough question. Like like you said, I played the development program. I think out of our 6D, I think all six of them are playing in the NHL. <laughs> so uh, I think one that sticks out to me is a guy that kind of flew under the radar his entire – I grew up with him my entire life is Matt Grizzlick. He was my roommate at the program. And um, I, I just remember when I think we were – we were roommates at the time and we were whatever, all those – central scouting list came out and he was never on him. He was always undersized. And I remember what's it called? We were in the car and his dad called him who works at the garden still. He's the best. Yeah. Uh, he called Matt. I was like, Hey, like, like I was talking, I was talking to Swedes the other day at the rink. He's like, they would love to, love to, uh, they would love to draft you. You know, if you're around and like, whatever, I think they didn't have a, fir- they had a, I think they picked Subi that year, but Grizzly would have been, I think they didn't have another pick to like the third round or something. Hmm. And Greg's like, yeah, my dad just called me. He was like, hey, like the Bruins said to like draft me. Like, threw it. I was like, yeah, okay, like they'll draft me. And then draft comes around. He's not on any list or anything like that. And then, what do you know, a third round comes around and Boston picks Matt Grizz like in the third round. And I, I knew it my entire life. He was always undersized, but he'd play in the NHL. Like the way he skates, the way he competes. He's got one of the best sticks of any defense I've ever played against. So, you know, for him, a guy who was over, undersized and always overlooked to make a career he's made is, is un- unbelievable. It came out last week in a report that the NHL is considering the World Cup of Hockey in 2025. Some are saying right now that you're the greatest American goal scorer alive. Of your generation. Even. That's yeah. right. Do you, do you have an eye on that? Is that something that you would be interested in, is playing for USA, especially when it's an in-season tournament? At least that's the, the report and the rumor. Yeah, absolutely. I think any time you can play... You know, for your country, it's it's an honor, and especially the way the world. I, I'm not. I don't remember what year it was. Whenever that last World Cup of Hockey was, but that was that was a blast to watch. It was it was great to watch that. And like I said, I wouldn't. You know, we got some good American sc- uh, goal scorers ahead of me. So you got <laughs> we got a lot of guys ahead of me. People are so, saying. Uh, <laughs> for me, I'm just you know, if I could whatever role I could be on that team, you know, it'd obviously be an honor to play on that team. But 
you know, like I said, I don't want to look too far ahead. And if my number gets called to be on that team, then I'd love to be a part of them if that team win. Uh, do you still get a lot of pizza questions? All the time. Really? <laughs> All the well, time. I'm not even going to ask a pizza question. I'm just going to uh, – I'll set you up to say – what's the pizza like out there? And by the way, for listeners, his family owns a pizza shop. Talk about all the time. The pizza in California is not, it's not great. It's not great. Why? They don't have the traditional like New York style here. There's like a couple, but it's nothing like back home. Like you can go anywhere in Boston or even New England. You can go to a hole, like usually the hole in the walls are the best place, but you can go to like a, whatever, a little, I don't know. 7-Eleven's got great pizza in New England. So, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, just I think in New England you can go anywhere and get a good piece of pizza. Here, it's kind of you have to track them down and find it. What do you uh, What do you think is the best chain pizza? Because around Massachusetts, I know you're Western Mass. Like we we like there was Papa Gino's everywhere. Obviously, there's Domino's yeah. everywhere. Like LeBron's got Blaze now. Like, yeah. what do you think is the best chain pizza? Have you ever heard of Jets Pizza? No. Jets. So Jets is like a Midwest kind of chain, and some some of the teams have it on the road. It's awesome. It's the best chain pizza going. Interesting. I'll be fucking. Would damn. you say the pizza thing is the most Italian thing about you, or is there like a secret like this guy is the most Italian guy in the world? No, I would say yeah, it's pretty my Italian kid from New England. Parents own a pizza shop. I don't think it gets more Italian than that. I'll tell you what gets more Italian than that: a hundred goals, and it's what you're on pace for, Frank Fatrano. We wish you all the luck the rest of the season. I don't know if you're on pace for a hundred goals, but it would be very neat. Thank you, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it.